Thank you, thank you. What, a, what an honor to be called up here to talk as the father of Vectrex. Little, little did we know years and years ago, 1981, 1980, when we were involved in the, the early stages of game development, what this would eventually be. We were just looking to do something different, something unique. And so uh, what I'm going to do is kind of tell you the stories as they, they roll out of the Vectrex. If we have time, I'll tell you little stories about Microvision, which actually preceded Vectrex. And then I'd love to get some questions, find out what you'd like to talk about. The, the Vectrex itself um, started one time at lunch when some of our programmers and designers, as they would do, went out to lunch and went to an Army-Navy surplus store. That was a big part of lunch going there to see what they could find. And they brought back a one-inch diameter CRT. It was about a foot long and it was an old instrumentation unit from an airplane. I don't know what it was used for, but that's what they said. And wouldn't it be great if we could put a little game on that CRT? Maybe even a handheld game or something like that. So. Well, we had two, three months, a lot of discussion, a lot of this, a lot of that, a lot more trips to the Army-Navy surplus store. But we came up with a product that we called Mini Arcade. And the idea was a vector scan game on a five-inch CRT. And we put it together with uh, a connection out to a videotape player. So you could play a game on there and sold it as a project to Kenner Toys. Cincinnati. We did a lot of business with Kenner, and they had done uh, an awful lot of things, particularly the Star Wars stuff. Another and so we uh, worked with them, trying to make it go and make it go. And about three months later, four months later, they said, "No, nah, that's just not for us. We're a toy company. We don't really think we'll compete in this area." And we then took it down the street. Our office was in Santa Monica. We took it down to Ed Krakauer. We had a little company called GCE, and we had done, uh, Ed used to work with um, Mattel, ended up the television program with Mattel for a while, then moved on, and had started his own company. We'd done a game watch for him, a game calculator, and said, how about this? And he fell in love, said, let's do it. This is about September of 81. He said, let's do it presented at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, June of 82, and put it on sale at the end of 82 for Christmas. I said, sure, why not? Develop a whole game system, 12 games and so forth, nine months, piece of cake. <laughs> well, 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 well. Out of that came the, uh, it has to be larger, so it was made a nine inch screen. It had. We took it and turned the screen sideways for a TV. This is a nine inch regular black and white TV screen. We sourced in the Orient, eight or nine dollars or something like that. And it turns out that was cheaper than a five inch screen and cheaper than a 15 inch screen. So this was the ideal thing to try to get it into the price range. And uh, start, started out on the quest to make this go. Why vector scan, you would ask? Why, why not just raster scan? In two words, zoom and rotate. If you remember back then, how do you make an object larger? You pull up another object from the memory and put it in there. How do you rotate it? You pull up another object from the memory. In vector scan, you just tweak some numbers. And also, there were a couple of outstanding games out there, not the least of which was Asteroids. It was showing all those things really, really well. And besides, it was different. So away we went. Um, the interesting thing about how do we get them to put a game up there, the first games that we tried were on an oscilloscope. You know, an oscilloscope is vector scan. It was along so by varying the voltages in and out at the proper times, we could get the game images on the screen. Uh, we had to take the tube that would present the image um, and put a different set of electronics <coughs> around the tube. If you know a TV, a TV is raster scan. You take the beam, run it across, turn it off, run it across. Um, 
30 times a second, then you'd want it interlaced another 30 times. So 60 cycles, you know, I'm dragging out of the memory, but to get that on, then you vary the brightness of the beam to make the picture up there. And interestingly enough, there was a video game patent by, turns out a friend of mine and a real pioneer in games, Ralph Baer, who pioneered in a raster scan environment a video game. And uh, I'm sure many of you heard about it, but this Ralph patented the video game, and the key to his patent was detecting collision or detecting overlay of two objects. And you really can't have much of anything if you don't get two objects together, whether you're batting them, swatting them, steering them on a road, doing anything. You have to know when two <coughs> objects on the screen are there. That's the basic video game patent he got. Sold it. Uh, his company took it over. That he he was a in the military, or Saunders Associates. They licensed it to Magnavox, which was taken over by Philips, and that became you know, the Philips Magnavox patent. And probably hundreds of millions of dollars of royalties ended up being paid. Only a few got to Ralph. But I digress. There's only one video game system that's ever been done that was not covered by that patent, and it was Vectrex, because it wasn't in a raster scan video system, it was in a vector scan. So we proceeded on in uh, developing that. We developed, identified and developed 12 games, and presented the prototype units and the 12 games at the Consumer Electronics Show, I think it was June of 82. And um, what were some of the features that really began to make that unique, and what are some of the limitations? One of the things is in a vector scan environment, you draw a line, and if you draw the line more than X number of inches, or keep drawing for more than something like 20 milliseconds, the line begins to disappear. So you're limited in how many lines, total length of lines you can draw on the screen. Um, that limits the amount of uh, items you can have on the screen. And it also has another problem in text. So if you go and look at the Vectrex, you get a chance to look at it, you'll see that many of the uh, screens, construction screens, starting screens, so forth, have text on them. And if you were to draw text with a T, H, E, look how many lines you've drawn just to say V. You run out of energy real quick. So two of the key guys in this whole project, there were many, 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 uh, Jerry Carr and John Ross. John Ross did a lot of the key uh, analog electronics for the electron beam. Jerry Ross did. <laughs> Jerry Carr did a lot of the uh, digital electronics. And one of the schemes that they came up with, Jerry did, was to draw a raster scan, a little box for text. So he drew seven lines and turned the beam on and off, and you could put text out on that line. That way you only drew seven lines instead of 23 or 123 for a line of text. Um, one of the uh, interesting considerations was uh, what processor do we use there? How big a, of a, a ROM is in there? And um, I think we wound up with the 6805. 6809. 6809. Was it I? Forgotten all the. Uh, the trade-offs we went through, but there was a lot of consideration about Intel processors, Motorola processors, which version of the Motorola processor, and what would have the longest life after we started, what could you add on and do the most things with. And it turned out to be a great choice because you can see in the museum in there all the things that have been done with it since, and then the things that got done with it during its original lifetime. And the other consideration was, um, you sell the unit, like an Atari, and then a cartridge for the basic game, much less expensive to put in the ROM built in inside. And so we had, a, I believe, an 8K ROM. The, the, the most recent experts. There's an 8K, there's a 4K ROM that was also in there in some of the games. And yeah, the games had, had 4K, usually had 4K, but the base unit, I think, had 8K, 4K for the operating system. 4K for the basic game, which was a shameless knockoff of uh, a breakout. So then we had uh, the basic decision was that every unit would come with the same game, at least for the 
initial production run of the uh, initial basic game. Another thing that that allowed us to do, the choice of the 6809, is apply some technology that we've been using in toys, which is to store by delta modulation a voice. So we took, in, uh, as you remember, Spike, Spike and Molly, and recorded some voice, and in that 4K, well, that portion of the 4K ROM, put a little voice uh, effort in there. And that was one of the first talking video games. So Molly, remember Spike, uh, and what he used to cry out. Um, so one of the other key things in the development of it was the analog electronics. Uh, in a uh, regular CRT, the beam just goes back and forth. We uh, built our own high voltage system to be able to control the, uh, the beam a little bit differently with a vector scan system. So when you get inside a vector X, you'll notice that it has a, a kind of a unique high voltage system. And then we also put different coils around the TV tube to control the movement of the beam. The beam in a regular CRT raster scan has to go sideways at a very monotonous back and forth rate but it doesn't go up and down and pause and move all over. So we did, developed and did our own coils. So if you look around again on the, the side of the neck of the tube, you'll see the special coils that we did to move the beam uh, to our specifications so that it could make a, a vector scan. The, um, the interesting story about some of the games that went on there initially was not so much a Vectrex story, but a story of game development in the early stages of video games. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the dust levels that you get into if you're playing the, the basic game that came with the unit. In, uh, in our design, in our wonderful, very talented designers, the best they could do as the, the game was uh, initially done is to get up to about level nine maybe level 10 uh, when the, uh, the mines were shooting back at you and you were shooting at things moving all around and the game um, they said well what we'll do is figure that maybe somebody who's a superstar could get to level 11 and then we'll put in level 12 and 13 and they'll be impossible nobody will ever get there but we'll put them in anyway and it wasn't but about a week after the game was released to the public that <laughs> we found out a couple of calls. What happens after level 13? What do you mean? And it turns out my young son was also one of those. And, oh, what a shock. So as, as many of you know, really good gamers could get up, get through level 13, and then by blind luck, it didn't blow up completely, it went into what then became called the dust levels. Uh, it wasn't planned for, it wasn't programmed, it just happened. The mines reduced themselves to specs, and yet they still had sort of the, some of the characteristics of the, of the moving mines and the other games. And I don't know the full story. I guess people have gone up, I've heard as high as 28. <laughs> I've heard as high as, uh, rumored, not, not confirmed, as high as level 39. <laughs> and none of them were programmed, none of them were planned, nothing there. It's a complete accident and uh, absolutely amazing story. Very embarrassing at the time, and you can imagine a lot of scrambling and so forth. And then it was eventually repaired and put out as a new and improved, uh, a stop. But uh, that was uh, one of the unique features of that. Then, uh, after it the first 12 games and it got launched. GCE uh, was bought by Milton Bradley and they took over and began producing a number of the, the later games. It went on, they did the, the 3D, the light pen, the music and some of the other things. And we concentrated on what could be the next iteration of Vectrex. And we then looked at what could we do to make it color. And it's black and white. Admittedly, it has the little color screens on the front. That was a, a crack hour, must be there, especially for TV and packaging. It has to look, because with that 
on and with the, uh, the screen in front of the TV2 color screen, transparent color screen on the package and the TV commercial, it looks great. And sort of as an aside, did, did you, uh, any, has anybody ever seen the Jackie Stewart TV commercial? You know, the, uh, the guy who was a championship road racer? He, he made a TV commercial for that. That was unbelievable. Uh, and I, since seeing some of the original, I've never seen a copy of it. No, as far as, uh, as far as what we have currently in the archives, we have one of the original Vectrex commercials, but it's just a, it's the typical uh, product placement, but uh, not the Jackie Stewart commercial, not yet. So if you have it in your in your storehouse of information, maybe I can get it from, it from Milton Bradley. There's still a, there's still a few guys still there who uh, remember those days. Um, but the, uh, the the next step obviously is what can we do for color? And we scratched our head and we worried and wondered. Even then, they were essentially doing the uh, razor and blades thing. They were losing money on what they were doing is selling the base unit, or certainly not making any money and trying to make it up on all the cartridges. They ended up, as you know, getting caught up in the 83-84 crash of the whole video games area. But before that, we had worked hard on what can we do to make the color Vectrex. So, first thing you do is, of course, look at a color two. And a color two, impossibly expensive. It's three guns, and a matrix, and this, and that, and everything. At least three times as expensive as a regular black and white two. And then it had three times the electronics inside. It was a non-starter. So we looked at the regular black and white tube that we had and thought, well, what happens if you put two layers of phosphor on the tube instead of a, a white layer that when the electron beam hits, if it goes white, makes a white line, then we put in a red layer, let it dry, and put in a green layer. And if we vary the power of the electron gun, maybe it'll hit one layer or go through that layer and hit the other layer. And we convinced the TV tube maker in the Orient to do that. He sent us a couple of samples. We put one together, and sure enough, it worked. And so there, right near the end of the run, we produced a color vectrex that could do um, green lines, red lines, and something in between, depending on where the power of the electron beam was. Now, the, the limitation on that is that uh, I'm not an analog electroniker, but to control the power of uh, 18,000, 16,000 volts and rapidly switch between the two is quite a trick. But at best, you can switch sort of fast between the two. So you would start out drawing a line, and it would be green, and then you'd switch at a point to draw a red line, and it would slowly go along the line from uh, red to green. But it got there. It created the effect pretty neat. And, uh, so there, there is a color unit in the... Uh, there's, there's a color unit. It's on display over in the museum right now, along with a few of the original color games. So there, there was something there. It didn't quite make it, make it out. As everybody knows, then in 83 and in 84, the whole video game industry collapsed in on itself. Um, too many terrible games at, at no money-making opportunity at all. And the, the trade, the retail trade, had always been, this was new to the retail trade. They built board games and cars and things like that. These electronic things were always kind of scary to them anyway. So when the sales began to fail, they said, oh, okay, that's it. Electronics is over, on to the next. And it was really Nintendo that kind of resurrected that over the next five or six years. That's a whole other story in games. Um, so, <coughs> If you, uh, if you have some questions on that, save them for uh, just a little bit. And let me tell you about one more project that we did that's sort of related to Vectrex, but preceded it, and it was called Microvision. And Microvision turned out to be the first handheld LCD game with a graphic matrix. Um, in the era when that was created, LCDs were just replacing LED displays in calculators and uh, other things that printed numbers and letters. and in an LCD, uh, a quick technology of LCDs, it's, it's two glass panels with uh, liquid crystal material trapped in between. 
and the uh, panels have polarizers on them so you can't see through them. Like this you can see through, this way you can. And the liquid crystals twist the light. So where when the when a an electronic trace on the inside of this one, an electronic trace there, when those are energized, the crystals in between twist and the light goes through or is let in and out to be reflected. So that's sort of the way a liquid crystal works. And the limitation uh, if you're going to create an image, uh, you draw the image in the electrical material, with the invisible trace that's there, and you light up the image and that's fine. But if you're going to do a graphic display with dots, you're okay on all the dots in one row or all the dots in one column. You turn on the column and you can uh, then do one, three, five, and nine. You can put on those rows. And the same in rows and columns, you put on row one, you can light up A, D, E, and H. But it's the diagonals that are the problem. Because if you light up A, you put on A and B, and one and two, you get four dots. Not two diagonal dots, you get four dots. So how do you do the diagonal? You light up A1, shut it off, light up B2, shut it off, light up C3, you get these three dots, but by the time you get to C, D4, dot A1 has faded out. That's, that was the, the limitation of a graphics display. And that was the, so we proposed doing a 16 by 16 graphic panel. 1978, something like that. Unheard, can't be done, don't bother us. We ended up making our own LCD doing a little um, chemistry to modify some LCD material and developing a computer-oriented scan system in, in all the calculator display. It was row one, row two, row three, row one, row two, row three, and each for 20 milliseconds or something like that. Sounds simple now, but we developed a computer technique so you could do row one, row eight, row 10 for a long time, then row three, and if you think of the first game that came out, our name Blockbuster, it had two or three rows of bricks, one row moving was dedicated to the ball and one row to the paddle. So we didn't have to light up all 16 at any one time. And with this computer controlled row scan, we got a patent on it, it allowed us to do this idea for the microvision, uh, the microvision system. So we put this together in a concept Got a special driver made use. I think made the driver. Um, I don't remember. It was a, even a big deal to get that made. Then we we're going to do cartridge programmable. What concept? Cartridges. But it turns out it was much less expensive to put the computer <coughs> with its own self-contained ROM in the cartridge. So all of the microvision systems had computer with a self-contained ROM in the cartridge. There was no no computer in the base unit, only a driver for the uh, for the display. And so out of that came this whole series of games from Milton Bradley. Uh, bless them for supporting that and getting it there. They were against licensing. But we were proposing the first game to come out with these space invaders. And it, uh, it came out with Blockbuster, which was fine, but that wasn't a, a well-known name. You had to say, ah, yes, that's a knockout, a breakout, I know that. And that turned out to be just, a, just an amazing machine. Uh, created uh, quite a bit of waves in the industry. It was the first handheld cartridge programmable game, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. And sure enough, going into that, we decided, well, you gotta do something in color. How do you do a colored LCD in 1980? It didn't exist. So, clever guys in my group came up with something called a quarter wave plate. Um, and remember I talked about how the LCDs work on the provision of polarization, like this, and the crystals turn it so that it effectively is like that. But if you put in instead of the polarizer on one of these, a quarter wave plate. Uh, the term quarter wave has to do with the, the light 
going through a quarter of the wavelength of the light will produce a color. And if you can take those crystals and turn them half on, you get one color. Three quarters on, you get another color. And full on, you get yet another color. Uh, does have to be backlit because this doesn't allow for anything going through and reflecting. So for Milton Bradley and that early time, we ended up making a handheld microvision unit that had a mirror that you click out the back to catch the room light coming through quarter wave plate and you could play games in color on microvision. Um, never made it in production. They weren't sure exactly, well, now, why would anybody really want a color handheld game that costs a lot more money, you know, especially not one the Game Boy or something like that. <laughs> and um, that, that turned out to be the, the sort of the, the trip through those two products. Um, one of the uh, interesting things that came out of that is I, I got to go and give, uh, give some lectures to uh, Palo Alto Research Center in the, in the Xerox area. They called me up, come on, what are you doing on these LCD displays that you can get 16 by 16 on? I gave a talk to them and went up and talked to Northern Telecom in Northern Canada. They were doing stuff trying to get breakthrough into simple, simpler uh, areas. Um, the, uh, I've got stories of actually even more products, but what I thought I'd do before that is see what kind of questions you mm -hmm. have about Vectrex and or Microvision and uh, what can I shed some light on. Was the uh, Star Trek the first licensed game for the Microvision for all games, period? I think it was. I think I think I don't think anybody had gone to them to license that before. There wasn't there wasn't a particular game, so we just licensed it and then built the game around around the name. But they did they licensed the uh, that they licensed a lot of the um, Centronics games. Uh, did not license asteroids, <laughs> and strangely enough, that never never wound up as a problem. Um, I, have, sure. I have both your systems, and they're awesome. Oh. But uh, I just wanted to uh, ask you about the hum of the Vectrex when I turn them on. They all seem to hum, and was that ever considered a problem? Or it it was. It wasn't. It, we can say this. It wasn't a design problem since none of the prototypes did it. We think it was a manufacturing issue. Um, yeah, certainly as, as uh, people have gone through the trucks over the years, we've seen some of the units from, let's say, Taiwan or Hong Kong or just different the different manufacturing facilities and, and even the runs have uh, slightly different grounding issues with them. Some of them are perfect and they don't hum at all. You can bring them right out of the box and right out of the box they were perfect, go online and you'll, you'll People swear that you know theirs has been perfect from day one. The rest, uh, you know, it's the Vectrex hum. It's part of the personality of it. And uh, after a while, when you fix your Vectrex, not the hum, you almost seem to miss it. Miss it, just personality. Uh, anything else? Uh, I have a question. Uh, you were discussing the uh, old man box patent on home video games. This is home twenty today. None of the companies you were involved with had any kind of patent on uh, handheld LCD that carry forward that they didn't want a lot of money? The question was, did, did it, anybody have patents on handheld LCDs? No. Um, we were breaking new ground then. I, you know, it, when you're breaking new ground, it seems that you recognize it later. You don't sort of recognize it at the time because it seems obvious you're doing it. But there was really very little they were thinking of graphics displays. People talked about graphics displays, and in the future, we're going to have graphics displays. The, the one point that everybody ran up against is that they wanted to control every dot all the time, and that was impossible at the time. And we said, eh, so control 10% of the dots, but the 10% moves around the screen. That's fine, and that's what made it go. So no, we never had any trouble with that. Knowing what you know now, would you have done anything different in design like these? Uh, yes, uh, yes indeed. A um, couple of things. One is the size of the unit. Uh, that, 
was an era where it wasn't clear that things that were small and unique were valuable. So the microvision was intentionally much larger than it had to be. If, if you remember the cartridge has the color overlay and a little place for the chip and then the rest of it's just plastic. The thing is at least twice as big as it had to be. Um, we argued, but they were paying the freight, and it was their judgment that in being that big and in a box on the shelf and in the commercials, it looked like more value if it was larger. So I would have made it smaller, and without any question, I would have licensed a, a number of things, uh, Space Invaders and other things, because since it was plowing the ground in handheld cartridge area, there was virtually every game you could have licensed. <coughs> Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the, the way sort of that different industries perceive um, the video games. You mentioned going to Kenner you know, with the backups and, and they were saying, oh, and you said, uh, well, they were a toy company, so they didn't want to get involved with it. But of course, they were like Mattel and Open Bradley. And there are many, uh, many toy companies who were involved. And I'm sort of uh, interested to know how much video games, I mean, I guess no one could figure out what they were exactly. But uh, how much were they perceived as toys, or how much were they thought of and sort of, sort of uh, brought out in, in the, uh, along with the toys and you know, sold through toy retail channels? And, um, you know, and to what extent did they, did they fit in that industry? Or not? The, the question was, paraphrasing real quickly, that were, were video games considered toys, or, uh, or how were they treated? And, and they, they definitely fit into the toy channel at the time. The, the people producing them, um, Atari went through the toy channels, uh, Parker Brothers, uh, we did a lot of business with Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers and Milton Bradley were separate at the time. Parker Brothers is Monopoly, Risk, Clue, um, just an old line toy company and they had a, a backer, they were had been bought by, was it Quaker Oats? No, uh, Quaker Oats was Fisher Price. But, um, I've forgotten. One of the big food companies had bought Parker Brothers and said their MBAs, and correctly so, said this is something new. It's big. Get into it. And Parker went in in a huge way. Um, we ended up doing a lot of work with them, uh, Hubert, and and a bunch of other things. Um, and. So Parker had its own channels, and this just added to the channels. In the time since then, it's separated out and has become clearly very separate. You go into the store, and toys and video games are, are separate. And video games have threatened the toy industry a great deal. Um, it, it used to be in days of old, they said that uh, by the time a young lady was 10 years old, she'd had 11 or 12 Barbies. And now you don't sell Barbies much more than six years old, something like that. There's occasionally. Uh, same thing with other toys. Um, you don't so much buy toys for little boys who are eight, nine, and ten anymore. Buying video games and other things. So it's a separate industry. It's really threatened and, and made problems for the toy industry. I, I, don't, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but uh, in the early days, how did leather companies Get into <laughs> <laughs> what, what was with the with Tandy and Coleco? You talk about Connecticut leather company. <laughs> so the question was, how did uh, Tandy and Coleco and leather companies get into the toy business? Uh, uh, Coleco, which stands for Connecticut Leather Company, got in. Um, they just branched out and started doing some toy things, and for whatever reason, really very early on picked up on the idea of video games. So they were, as, as you well know, preceded Atari. The dedicated console games that they were doing. Um, that was a wild bunch, the Greenbergs. They were crap shooters. <laughs> they uh, try it and fail, oh, come back again. So it was funny with the Atom computer, they didn't recover. But uh, along the way, the Cabbage Patch doll did pretty well. <laughs> so, and Candy, well, that's Radio Shack, right? So that's sort of a natural for Radio Shack to get involved. And there are 
they're still just a region. I don't think they're that much in terms of game development. Can you talk more about your work environment and the group of guys you work with? Um, was it you had a product in mind and then you decided how to make that product, or someone comes up, you know, comes up with an AP with a quote or a collection board, and then then you figure out what to do with it? No, we we uh, we were reasonably serious inventors, and the um, I my personally background wise uh, went to undergrad school at Virginia Tech. Uh, glad they survived and have done very well, and I'll be back there in a couple of months. And graduate school at Caltech, and I was going into the aerospace industry, and, in our, and I did work for TRW on the uh, uh, on the LIM module, which was that's a, that's a whole other story. You know, about that. the uh, the LIM just uh, just a quickie on that the LIM rocket and the lunar module rocket engine. A, you know, a rocket is a controlled explosion. And they perfected it over the years from Goddard on down. You put in fuel, like it blows up, and it keeps blowing up at the same rate. That's that's a big deal. Um, and it's very carefully metered in. The lunar module was a throttleable rocket engine, and so they it would go from 10% to 100%. And it had, um, of course, it wound up with several areas of combustion roughness after they made it quit exploding, then it was just roughness, and they wound up, as I remember, with three roughness at um, 65, 37, and 20, or something like that. They managed to get one at 20 and 65, they designed out, and one at 37, they couldn't do anything with. The problem is, hover is 37%. <laughs> so they actually moved it. The only thing they could do is move it. And when it went to the moon, it had combustion and roughness bad combustion roughness at 58% or something like that. And it was a, just a sign, do not run at 58%. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was, I, that, so one day after being at TRW and having interviewed Mattel at, um, when I got out of graduated from school, uh, Mattel called back and said, are you ready now? I said, yes, I'm ready. And I went over there and worked on a bunch of projects. Uh, fascinating stuff. The toy industry is much more complex than it would seem to be. And uh, I was lucky to be an aerospace engineer and go in there. I think every aerospace engineer thinks, well, if all goes wrong, I can go work in toys. That's, that's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> in there, but then left there and started my own company. And by the time we got involved with this, uh, we started, our initial effort was um, to do some Atari games. Well, it wasn't very popular with Atari, but to do some of that, and then it quickly became some other thing, other things to do, and we were doing toys in parallel with that. And we developed a group of, at its high point, I think, was some 40 people, uh, 15 in Palm Bay, Florida, right outside Melbourne, Florida, and the balance was here in Santa, uh, in Santa Monica. And it was a it was a really happy-go-lucky, passionate group of programmers and designers and graphic people and toy designers mixed with uh, uh, video game engineers. And um, I was sort of the inventor of the group, and the, it was called the company was called Western Technologies, and I had a separate little entity called Smith Engineering, the inventor. And so I went around talking to people toys and video games, what do you want? What would make it work? And the key to inventing things is to solve somebody's problem. You, you don't go and you make some coils and things and say, what is this good for? You go and find out, what does somebody want? And more importantly, what will they pay for? And that's that's how we eventually got, I, I told you on Vectrex, we got from the little uh, CRT to the mini arcade. We would visit with Kenner maybe once every two or three months, maybe even more than that, on the projects we were working on. So we started talking about this. If we could do this, how would you like it? Yeah, right. Wonderful. Bring it on. You know, and and we actually were able to get them to give us money to develop the idea. And so we did that. So uh, they, we put some of our own in. They gave us advanced royalties. We developed it to a point, and they said, nah. Even going to work for us. Um, can't tell you all the reasons now, but it, it turned out great because 
GCE was a great supporter of it. And they, they were a very freewheeling group, could see the potential in it. And so these 25 guys, we had, um, I think at least half or two thirds were programmers doing, doing the game and the rest were the hardware engineers doing the hardware. And the, the people in Florida, all of those were just the programmers. So it was a it was a wonderful time. We had lots and lots of fun. Um, worked impossible hours, and as I mentioned, this uh, one of the guys on our staff named Jerry Carr. He's really a genius at what he does. He's got other problems, but he's a genius. And he he would get stuck on something. And one of the things we would do is usually about 10 o'clock at night, just take a walk around the neighborhood. Can't, it can't be done, it can't be done. So we'd walk and walk and walk and walk and talk. And by the time we got back, he said, I don't know, leave me alone. And I'd come in in the morning and he'd solve the problem. And it was that, that kind of environment, exciting to be with, exciting to see it go. What are you doing since the crash? The, we went back into toys right away. Downsized, way down. And went back into toys, and the, we came out with several things. We had done toys all along, but the thing that broke us out of that was a doll for a balloon called Baby Talk, and it sold uh, a million two pieces over its lifetime. It was a, just a talking doll in an era when you could make talking dolls and sell them for fifty-nine dollars. Remember Teddy Ruxpin, sort of that era, in there. So that spurred us on to a number of other things. And then, in parallel with that, as you know, Nintendo got in and started selling their games. And if you remember, Nintendo was selling it half game, half toy at the time. It was a robot that would stack all this stuff. And the commercials were more of the robots stacking the stuff than the games the Nintendo unit could play. And so they, despite trying to get involved with Atari, they went out on their own, did it, and by the time Everybody in the retail environment here in the U.S. They're selling a lot of product, <laughs> uh, but don't worry, it's it's going to go away. <laughs> One more. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, ever put together a comprehensive list of all the games that were in development or even were finished? Because I mean, there's like like today, there's going to be another game that's going to pop up, and then it's always rumor until it exists. But then all of a sudden it exists, and things like Port of, Port of France and some others have popped up over the years. Did you guys, did anyone basically know what all was under production out of your uh, group? Was it written down somewhere? It was, but we didn't do it. It was, at that time, GCE, the, the Milton Bradley folks had the list. And since then, uh, these, uh, many of you key yeah. guys, Chris and Rick and many of you others, have carried the ball. I'm. Uh, I'm sort of a bystander and amazed bystander in the, in the attention and the success that this is getting and the things that people are doing blows my mind. This is the 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. is that? 25 years ago, and they're still doing stuff like that. Yeah, I've seen uh, at uh, many other uh, game shows, I saw an application to the original game. You probably could not ever have thought of happening they had one of the games feed through a PC to a projector. And they projected the game onto the side wall of the convention center. <laughs> Playing it X, Y, block. And it was gorgeous. Uh, with all the lights on, you could still see it. It was gorgeous. And it was must have been 25 by some feet. And it was just it's an application. You I would you love to have seen it. The, uh, his comment was projecting a, a Vectrex, Vectrex game on the PC, going to projector, projected on the wall of the convention center. <laughs> I would have loved that. Back in the day, uh, what did you think about the European market? About launching products and so on? Again, this, as developers, we didn't get very involved in that. I know the uh, GCE folks were very interested in that and nurtured a lot of the early stuff that went on. And I, frankly, I wasn't aware of it that much then and it's only after that I've become aware how much went on and how many 
incredible fans there were over there, and people that really paid attention to it. Do you know how many Vectrexes are out there? No, I don't. I, I would guess a number. What would you guess? Uh, yes. We've seen serial numbers start at different ranges, different ones. There's someone that's rumored to have a serial number two uh, that popped up in Australia somewhere. But um, it also depends on which ones you're talking about. The Milton Bradley runs is a GC run. Certainly the, the European community, you know, there's the Swedish one, uh, version of, of the box, there's the Spanish version, there's the German version, and there's, there's a kind of a multi-language version. So uh, from the original um, from the original unit, the, the only one I've heard about was uh, number two, and, and the rest, uh, who knows how many were produced when the, when the Milton Bradley partnership took off and started distributing them on a global basis. And that's, that's not even counting the other partnership with Bandai that had uh, the Cuso games the, and the unit that came out. And it's, it, 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 it's hard to determine the final number that was of the final amount that were produced. I, I, I don't know at all. My, my gut guess is it's in the low hundreds of thousands. Oh, probably. Mm -hmm. 100, 300, way more than 100, I'm sure. Maybe less than 300,000. I, I really don't know. Uh, we, we were, uh, one of the great business accomplishments of that is that we were bought out of the product at one time. They said, oh, we're going to pay you way too much royalty. Will you take a check? Said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions in the back? I've been too many in the front here. question was, if Vectrex came out today, would I like to be involved as an advisor? And, uh, would it come out as a handheld? Um, I, don't, I don't know, but that triggers a, triggers a comment that I, I hadn't mentioned, is that we took a, a, a swipe at making a Vectrex handheld. Hmm. 1990? Yeah, around the was it? With Clive, Clive Sinclair's, uh, Clive Sinclair, a great uh, British inventor, had put out a handheld TV that was a CRT, a cathode ray tube that was bent, like folded, and it, the neck of the tube went like this, and then it turned 90 degrees to the face of the tube. And is, um, do I remember that the that, uh, oscilloscopes are static deflection and televisions are magnetic deflection of the Correct. electron beam. Correct. And this was a static deflection, which is quick and low power. Ah, that's a Vectrex, of course. And we called them and talked to them, and they had just shut down the plant. So don't lock the doors. We've got to talk to Milton Bradley about this. We put together <laughs> one real quickly, and we piped a Vectrex game into the TV through a video. And here, it was gorgeous. This little handheld CRT vec uh, vector scan playing on the screen. And nah, they didn't do it. They, they actually went and looked at the plant, and I've forgotten where the plant was, but uh, we took a whack at making it into a handheld. So that, yes, I would love to have seen it as a handheld. I don't know if it could survive against all the graphic images that are there today, because the uh, the, the original Vectrex had some cost and capability advantages being a vector scan, which don't exist today. So, anyway, I, yes, if it went there, I'd love to be an advisor. I don't want to do it again. I have been there and done that. Um, well, thank you so much. We, uh, I think we've overstayed our bounds. I'm so pleased that you are interested in it. Love to continue to be involved. I'll be back again. Vectrex will be 30 years old in five years. And we'll probably have quite an event for that. I think Microvision will be 30 years old uh, two years from now. So 
I'll be back to talk about uh, the first LCD graphic screen cartridge programmable handheld game. Thank you, Mike.